So in this video, we're going to talk about uh, ecosystems, metal cycling, and energy flow. This is a review video. I did other videos where I'm into more detail in each of the objectives we're going to be covering in this video. Uh, and it's meant to help students pass a content assessment in the Summit platform for middle school science. However, it can be useful for any student that has to learn about general ecology, things like nutrient cycles, food webs, food pyramids, energy pyramids, uh, decomposition, and the roles of organisms in the ecosystem in transferring matter around from one place to the other, and also energy. All right. Now, uh, if you need a detail, you need to watch one of these other videos where I explain it better. This is just going to be a review for someone that's about to take the test or just needs a little bit of a push before passing it. So the first objective is this idea of food webs, food pyramids, and different diagrams that represent the flow of matter and energy in ecosystems. So a food pyramid uh, has layers showing the decrease of energy as you go up the trophic levels. And that happens because each organism uses energy to be, stay alive, to do its work, to reproduce, to build things. And so in that way, energy is consumed in each layer of the ecosystem. Uh, and a lot of energy is also wasted as heat. And so in between, so that means that as little as 10% of the energy goes from one level to the next. That means that as you go up the, the levels of feeding, which are called trophic levels, trophic means food, um, there's less and less energy available. So the apex predator, which is the one at the top, has a lot less energy for it than the producers at the bottom, which has the most energy. Uh, carnivores uh, usually are larger and eat animals uh, at a higher level, right? So that means they also are going to be limited in numbers because they have less energy available at their level. Um, herbivores, which by the way, is, is, a, is a usually misused as the first layer above producers. Herbivores are, are, are consumers that eat grass and herbs. And technically you get frugivores and florivores that also eat plants, but they don't eat grass or herbs. And so they're not herbivores. So that first layer includes anything that eats plants, mostly herbivores, of course. Uh, now, what they all have in common is that they only eat producers. And that's going to be the second level with the most energy. Uh, and then levels above it, like the carnivore levels, are going to have less energy available. Now, the there's also omnivores, which are organisms that sometimes act like herbivores and sometimes act like carnivores. Uh, and you have that. It depends on the chain that you they're, they're involved. Now, uh, in chains or, pyramid, or webs, you see the flow of energy from organism to organism in the ecosystem. And... Each transfer is represented by this arrow going the direction of who's actually eating it. And so the primary consumer, which is another word for things that eat producers, or which include the herbivores, frugivores, and frugivores, um, they are going to be the ones eating directly from the ones that trap the sunlight and get the nutrients to make the food, which we'll call producers or autotrophs. Auto means self, troughs means food, so feeding itself. All the other ones are called consumers or heterotrophs, which means eating others. Hetero means others. Uh, the primary consumers eat directly from the source, and the secondary consumers will eat primary consumers, and the tertiaries will eat secondaries, and so forth. The key difference is that as the matter transfers throughout, energy is used up each time, and so there's less and less useful energy available, meaning there's going to be a lot less hawks than snakes, and a lot less snakes than frogs, and a lot less frogs than grasshoppers, and so forth, right? So the richest level is going to be the level of producers which actually supports everything else. A food web is kind of like the same thing, except it shows all the relationships within the ecosystem, not just one or one series of that, but all the feeding relations between the organisms that make up the ecosystem. But it also, energy flows from the sun to the producers, into the food web, and so forth. One thing that also matters is this idea of decomposition, which is they eat from all across the food web. So uh, this diagram makes it look like it's only the last one that gets decomposed, but technically anything that dies, including the plant themselves, can get decomposed. And then that cycle, and we're going to talk more about that in a second, but their role is to basically cycle nutrients, right? Now, uh, just to be clear on the most important parts you're probably going to be tested on, the source of energy for most ecosystems on the Earth is the sun. And the pyramids use the, the show the decrease in energy as you go up the levels, which also means less Biomass can be supported. Less organisms can be supported as you go up the levels. Um, food chains show one pathway of energy transfers, and food webs show multiple pathways of that. Uh, and uh, the energy flows to the ecosystem from the producers uh, to the primary consumers, which only eat producers, to secondary consumers, and henceforth up and up the trophic levels and getting used up every single time. It does not cycle back to the start. It gets used up or lost as heat. 
while the matter gets cycled back through the decomposers. Less energy is available at higher levels because it gets used up or lost as heat, which means the higher trophic levels can have less organisms, especially since they tend to be bigger, right? Bigger organisms live at the top because they have to eat little, little things, which eat little things, which eat little things. And so they tend to be larger at the top. But if they need to be larger with less energy, that means less of them, a lot less of them. And so that's why the top of the food web is, has, has less diversity than the bottom does. Now, what happens uh, with the prey if uh, predators increase? If you have too many predators, uh, you're not going to have to be able to support them enough with the, with the prey. So there's going to be less prey because they're going to eat too much. But then if there's less prey, the predators will also die out. And so they will also tend to decrease. Now, <clears throat> the second objective has to do with the key role that decomposers play in all of this. And decomposers is a word that's sometimes used interchangeably about any of these organisms that eat on dead stuff. But technically, only bacteria and fungi are real decomposers, which are the ones that break down the matter back to essential nutrients. The other ones are called detrivores, which um, eat um, and break that food down into larger chunks. They feed on carcasses. A special type of detrivores is called scavengers, and they are opportunistic uh, predators that um, eat carcasses. And sometimes they actually act like predators as well, like a wolf. He won't pass on a carcass. Do remember that all of this is happening inside of the ocean as well, um, a process of recycling of nutrients. Now, the decomposer's key role is to provide the matter that producers need to do their job. They primarily get the, the matter that they need from the air because carbon dioxide is, the, is what most of the biomass of the, of the producers is made of. But they also need other essential nutrients like phosphates, nitrates, and nitrites, which can be found in soil and water, think, thanks to the effect of decomposers. Um, so producers can use the energy of sunlight to make food. That's why they call phototrophs. By the way, there are some uh, producers which don't use sunlight. They live in extreme environments. They call them chemotrophs, and they use other chemical processes to make food. But most of the ecosystems on Earth are based on sunlight. Now, they can do that, but only if there are nutrients available for them to do so. And so without the nutrients, you have limited produ production of uh, less growth of the green stuff. Now, that's part of the reason why cold ecosystems – are so uh, lack productivity. You would think it could be this lack of sunlight, but there's plenty of sunlight, especially during the summer months. You would think it would be the lack of water because of cold water. There's less precipitation less because of less evaporation. But a lot of times it's actually the decomposers which are limiting things because the nutrients are not cycling fast enough because decomposition goes slow in the cold. And that's why some ecosystems that are cold have a lot of trouble uh, producing a lot. Uh, so energy flows through ecosystems because decomposers do not give it back the energy to the producers. It's used up. But the matter is cycled back uh, through the role of decomposers in ecosystems. And so all organisms in the ecosystem are actually broken down by decomposers, all levels. So in a chain, sometimes you have the misconception that, like you see on this one, that only the last one gets decomposed. But technically, every organism gets broken down uh, into smaller chunks uh, by decomposers. And um, the chunks that actually get used up by plants are going to be nitrates, nitrites, phosphates, uh, carbon dioxide, and water. Those are the essential nutrients that plants are going to use. Speaking of essential nutrients, there are cycles in life that uh, where you see these nutrients going through the different spheres of the world. You do not need to know the stages, the names of the processes of the cycle by heart. What you do need to be able to do is recognize the key features of the cycles where life actually acts. In my other videos, I broke down each cycle in great detail. On this one, because it's a review video, I'm going to focus on what matters the most for the test, so which is how is it that the matter is actually transferred through all ecosystems? So first of all, producers will pick that up right from the soil in the form of basic nutrients and use the energy of sunlight to make food out of it. And then they will enter the consumers through that food. As consumers eat, they get the atoms, the matter. Then they become part of the organism or are released as waste in urine, solid waste, or in the case of carbon dioxide, it goes through the lungs, uh, uh, through gills, or just diffuse out of the body. Now, atoms pass from organisms to organisms through consumption. And throughout the food web, that way, the, the, the matter gets transferred. And with it, the energy that's stored in that food. But ultimately, all the atoms return back to the non-living parts of the ecosystem through decomposition, one way or the other. So decomposers break down both the waste and the carcasses. Now, that, some of that goes to the air, and some of that goes to the soil. 
So let's talk about that using the carbon cycle. So the carbon cycle uh, interacts with life because life absorbs it from the air or water. So living, not living to living through photosynthesis, right? And that's the producer, cyanobacteria, algae, and plants that do that. Now, some of the carbon dioxide that's released to, by life actually returns back to the soil or to the water and it gets trapped into rocks or mineralized, all right? Now, which chemical, carbon dioxide is the only chemical, though, that can go straight from the air or water into uh, life forms. Nitrogen and phosphorus uh, will actually require uh, extra steps, which involve bacteria. And that's why carbon cycle is special. It's faster. And what forms do, in what ways do the life interacts with the carbon cycle? Again, through photosynthesis, uh, you go from water or air into life. And the opposite, cell respiration from producers, consumers, or decomposers. They all need to do breakdown of food. As they do so, they release carbon back to the air and to the water. So that's life to non-living. Uh, decomposers also release it to the air during the process of decomposition. And those were the three that are between life and the non-living water and air. Then you also have exchanges between life and the geosphere. Because decomposers release carbon that can become trapped as minerals in the water or soil and then eventually become part of rocks. Also, there are some organisms that have carbonate skeletons that can become fossilized into rocks, like limestone, for example, is an example of that, and or mineralized by decomposers and trapped into rock. And entire organisms can become fossilized, especially the bony parts, which have carbon in it, of course, and then become part of uh, rocks as fossils. So the first three facts were exchanges between biosphere and in hydro and, and, and atmosphere. And the last three facts are exchanges between the biosphere and the geosphere. Uh, all of these are examples of exchanges between living and non-living parts of the ecosystem. And those are the key ones you have to know about the carbon cycle uh, to get do, do well on the test. Do note that the carbon cycle requires the energy of the sun to work because without it, you would not have the plants trapping carbon dioxide. The water cycle was also explained in detail in my other video. But what I want to focus on is how the life contributes to the water cycle. So life forms contribute to the water cycle because plants and animals uh, get exposed to sunlight, get overheated, and then they transpire water through their pores to actually cool down in a process called evapotranspiration. And in that way, the water goes from life to the atmosphere. Organisms also produce wa water from oxygen during cell respiration. So they get oxygen and then break that oxygen down to make water out of it. Uh, uh, co combining with hydrogen, uh, and that gets released to the ecosystem. So life to non-living. Photosynthesis uh, also uh, uses water from from because producers need the water in order to uh, do photosynthesis and end up releasing back the oxygen. So these two last ones kind of balance each other out in a way. Then you have the organism's consumption of water for the purpose of hydration, since 80% of water is made, uh, life is made of water. So in all of those ways, life interacts with the, with the water cycle. Uh, and, of course, the sun is also very important for this cycle because it makes water evaporate. It, makes, it heats up the organisms, making uh, the water uh, evaporate by evapotranspiration. Uh, and, of course, you need it for photosynthesis. And it's also what drives the weather that does other parts of the cycle as well. So sun is very, very important for the water cycle. The nitrogen phosphorus cycles are two cycles that do not uh, – uh, happen without the help of bacteria. Uh, the nitrogen cycle is specially. It is specialized bacteria that put the nitrogen into the atmosphere, and that's a very ancient process, which is why the atmosphere is so rich in nitrogen. But there's also other bacteria that fixate that and trap it back into the soil or the water. And there are other bacteria that get that and transfer into ammonia, others that get that and transfer into nitrites and nitrates, which is what can actually be used by life forms in the soil that, that get the nutrients from the soil or from the water, uh, the producers that we're going to use those. Um, meanwhile, the rest of the ecosystem gets the nitrogen from consumption, right? The producers will get eaten and then it will transfer from person to person, or animal to animal, organism to organism. Uh, hopefully not person to person. Uh, yes, uh, but you know what I mean. Now, or organisms die or they release waste, either solid waste or liquid waste like urea, uh, they will actually be broken down by the same decomposers back into the same cycle. And some others will actually release it back to the atmosphere. Now, all of this happens with the help of bacteria. Uh, 
in a processes that require that do not require oxygen and are much much more ancient ways of getting energy and surviving uh, outside of the uh, photosynthesis to carbon uh, cytosynthesis and cell respiration uh, realm of things. But they're still connected to the carbon cycle in a way because they break down the food and waste that comes from the food webs, which rely on the sun, right? The last is the phosphorus cycle. And that's the one that most often limits the productivity of ecosystems because unlike other cycles, it, it relies heavily on the process of erosion and deposition to move uh, phosphorus from an area that has a lot of it to an area that has less of it. Other than that, only a volcanic eruption spreading into the air would uh, add phosphorus to other ecosystems. So when life forms use phosphorus from the soil, from the water, and we're talking about producers again, they make food and then they all eat each other. They die, returns back to the soil with the help of decomposers. But then only uh, erosion and weathering and uplift can actually move that. And those are processes that are geological and they get very long periods of time. And so when a, when a soil or an, or an air of water is not rich in those, it takes forever to become rich in those because it relies on these processes, which can also be random in the way that they distribute the things. And so um, it's going to be more common near – uh, near river mouths, right in the ocean, because that's where all the sediments are dumped into, or or in areas where the soil uh, is rich near volcanoes, or where you have been a lot of decomposition in the past. Um, that's where the phosphorus is going to be at. But once you lose that richness of the phosphate, it's really hard to get it back by natural means, which is why a lot of fertilizer is focused on adding phosphorus to the soils. Uh, but it's hard to get that. Um, you have to mine it, you have it, and it takes forever for it to cycle naturally. All right. So that is uh, the, the, the overall picture uh, that you have to not lose for this whole thing is that in the end, matter cycles through ecosystem from producers through the food web back to, through the composers to nutrients, which get used again by the producers to make the food. But energy flows from the sunlight to the producers inside the food, throughout the food web, and it gets used up, which means less and less organisms are uh, can be supported at higher and higher trophic levels. All right? So I hope you found this helpful. And there's more detail on the other playlists if you're confused about something still. I'll see you later. And don't do anything that would not make your mama proud. <laughs>